church. We're so glad to be here together this morning. Go ahead and stand with us. We're gonna lift our voices together and sing to the King. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures the faith are never enough. Then you came along.
Well, good morning and welcome to Warren. We're so grateful that you come to worship with us here today, to join with us in singing and declaring who our God is, and in just a minute to join with us in celebrating lives that are still being changed by our God who is still at work. And so thank you for being here. If you're a guest, we want to say a special thank you to you for being here. Whether you're a guest joining us in person or a guest joining us online or wherever you're at, we're just grateful that you've chosen to worship with us. And we'd love to know that you're here. We'd love to know, be able to connect with you or answer any questions you might have. So you can scan that QR code on the pew in front of you or at the end of the pew and just let us know who you were here. If you'd like for us to pray with you, if you have any questions or you want to get involved, uh, just scan it. Let us know. We'd love to just know you're here to say thank you for visiting. But now as we come to a great part in the service, something I I pray that we get to do every single Sunday is to celebrate the song we just sang about. The fact that our God still takes dead things and makes them alive and takes us out of our dead and out of our dead and our trespasses and he moves us to new life. So I want to ask the Parton family to come up. We've got Sarah and Ben, Riley and Evelyn, And we're so grateful. We've got two being baptized today. And I think Ben, I think your daughter told you you were going first, right? So we'll get Ben in here. And Ben has grown up in the church and gave his life to Christ at a young age in a different denomination. But over the past couple of months, years that God's been kind of working in his heart, drawing them and their family to Warren to be a part of our church family. Ben has just agreed to just set the example to follow not only in the humility of coming under the banner of Warren Baptist Church, but in declaring that he's no longer dead to his sins, but that Jesus is still alive and still saving. Set example for his family and to join us as a family of believers. And so we get the opportunity to celebrate that with Ben today. So Ben, I would just ask, would you confess that Jesus is the Lord? And do you believe with all your heart that God raised him from the dead? Yes, and yes. Yes. Well, it's by your profession of faith that I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism unto death, raised to walk in new life. Next, we have his daughter, Riley, nine-year-old Riley, who uh, six months ago had a similar conversation but one was an original conversation of realizing that she was a sinner, realizing that when she reads the Bible, it's not just talking about other people, it's talking about her, and that she needed a savior. She began talking with the minister of the church they were at, talking with her parents, and just realizing that she needed Jesus. And so she's been praying, she prayed that prayer a few weeks ago, has been talking with her family, talking with Carol here in our our kids' ministry, And so I'm so excited to share with everyone today, and she's excited to share with everyone today that she's given her life to Jesus. And so Riley, I would ask you the same questions. Would you confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life and do you believe that God raised him from the dead? Well, it's upon your profession of faith that I have the pleasure of baptizing you, my little sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in the baptism unto death and raised to walk in new life. Amen. Would you join me in prayer as we celebrate two lives that God is still in the business of saving? Father, thank you that you are still working miracles. God, that you are still intricately involved in our lives when the world makes us feel like you're not. So God, may we live lives of abundant joy because of things like this that are reminders of the salvation you've brought many of us in this room. And for those of us that don't know you, would this be just a catalyst of movement, of change, the Holy Spirit working in their lives? So God, we celebrate this as a family, that you've brought another into the fold, and we are just so excited about what you're gonna do in the days, the weeks, the months, and the years to come. We love you, we praise you, we worship you with all that we have because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship him together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. 
Sing this from our hearts, church. Proclaim it. And I will build. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my
question what can watch away my sins it is nothing but the blood of Jesus and so from today until eternity we know that we will be singing of your honor and glory because of the way that you have sacrificed yourself so that we might live we live in these fallen homes today in our flesh but one day we will be completely free from sin that will no longer entangle us and we are saved to sin no more. Our worship, we can't properly express our hearts to you now, but one day free from sin, we will worship you in perfection because of what you have done for us. It's nothing that we could do, it's all what you did for us. So this morning we say thank you and we worship you. Lord, as we come to hear your word now, help us submit to what you have to say to us. God, you're calling us to something greater than we can see right now. So as you make us more like you this morning, would you help open our eyes to what you have for us? What you have for us is so much better than what our own plan is. So help us to lay down our lives for you this morning in this place. We pray this all in the strong and mighty name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. The great celebration of the Christian message is redeeming love. It's the fact that God loves us, but not just with an emotional love, but an active love that was interventional, coming in to redeem us, and that becomes the theme of our lives once the gratitude and the grace of God uh, fills our hearts. And so I'm thankful to hear you sing and celebrate and share that in this gathering here in our worship center but I also need to welcome all of those who are gathered with us in our chapel service this morning. And I especially want to say thank you to one of our uh, large life groups that was willing to make a shift to be able to help to balance the numbers of people in the chapel on Sunday mornings. Thank you to all of you today. Welcome all of our online uh, platforms, whatever you may be viewing from. And then always, we welcome those of you who are joining with us through our Warren A Way of Life broadcast. And so, just to be sure you're not just spectators out there, but that you know that we here in this room are grateful for you, would you help me to welcome all of those groups and let them hear from you this morning as we begin in this hour today. Now, on this day, on this campus and on all of our campuses, uh, today, we are providing a very specific focus, and that is that today we are engaging in a focus whereby we are providing information and offering opportunity and issuing a call for people, people not in general, but people like the eyes of those to whom I'm looking into this morning, to be willing to avail themselves to be a part of serving in the life and the ministry of Warren and through all the different outlets and all the different opportunities that we have through the life and the ministry of our church. We have three overarching goals. 
We have three unswerving commitments that we absolutely want to challenge and to reinforce and to, if you will, uh, demand in the life of everyone who is a part of this ministry. And that is that we want every person affiliated with Warren to be involved in three critical activities or commitments. Number one, worship. Number two, connect. Number three, serve. Worship. We want to be sure that you are a part of gatherings of worship, whether on this Augusta campus or Belvedere or Grovetown or however it may be, even through an online experience for those who can't be here. We want to be sure that people gather to worship and that worship is a priority for us in ministry. And then we want to encourage people to connect through life groups, small group gatherings, discipleship training. We want to be sure that we are building communities of people who connect together to the Lord and to one another and care for one another. And then ultimately, we want to be sure that everyone who is engaged in this ministry is not just a worshiper and a part of a small group, but that you have a platform and a place to serve. So the goal is worship, connect, serve. Can you say it with me? Say it. What are we looking for in the life of everyone who's affiliated with Warren that they would? Say it again. One more time. That's not very hard, is it? They're easy words to say. But the truth of the matter is, is that there is a glue. There is a glue that holds each one of these in place and that brings all of these together in our lives. And that glue is the glue of commitment. Commitment. It's not just enough to know about the need to worship and connect and serve. There has to be within each one of us individually a commitment a commitment to worship, a commitment to connect, a commitment to serve, and that that commitment is something that becomes a driving force in our lives. And as a pastor across many years, I have found that it is much easier to get people to commit to the first two and to leave off the last one. It's easy to say, I'll worship when I can, as often as I can. I'll even connect occasionally. But you know, I'm really living a busy life and it's just hard for me to really commit to serve. But God's church is not intended to be filled with people who are pew sitters and bench warmers. We are all to be engaged in the work of the gospel together. And we are together in the gospel, in God's reconciling mission in the church. And we've just studied last week this whole idea about reconciliation five times in the last part of the text that we studied last Sunday, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. The the scripture reiterates reconciliation, reconciled, to be reconciled. God is involved in a reconciling work through the cross of Jesus Christ, bringing lost people, aliens, enemies into fellowship and relationship with him. That's how we come to Christ. That's how we become a part of his church. But once we're a part, we are to engage in that reconciling work and we are to carry the theme of redeeming love to people everywhere. So commitment. That's what I'm challenging. That's what I'm addressing in your life and in my life today. And so in order to do that, I want us to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Woodrow Kroll has said, when it comes to God's command, the issue is not clarity, it is commitment. Most of us have a a sense of clarity about things that the Bible instructs, expects. The challenge is that commitment. But I want you to see here today in the context of a, a very challenging reality, the culture and the church with whom Paul was relating, I want you to see in his life some of the characteristics of commitment that I think that are essential for us 
if we're going to fulfill this goal to worship, connect, and serve. So let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Working together with Him, Him meaning God, Working together with God in what? That work we were just talking about, reconciliation, chapter 5, verses 18 through the end of that chapter. Working together with Him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I've helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, kindness, patience, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors, yet true, as unknown, yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. If there's one word that defines and describes what Paul said about his life and his ministry to the church at Corinth and in the context of the culture of that day, is that Paul was committed to do whatever needed to be done to fulfill the mission of God, to engage in the work of reconciliation. And so it is that today, as I am gathered with God's church, And we are living not in the first century, but the 21st century. That every one of us needs to see and know and understand what this call, what these characteristics of commitment look like when it comes to us and serving the Lord in this generation. And so what I want to do over these next few moments is that I want to take time to talk to you and to challenge you to areas of commitment both on our campuses in our community, and as we seek to go and to reach the nations of the world as we live out this gospel mission that has been given to us. So let's look at some things that Paul provides as both an example and as a challenge. Number one, when we read this passage of Scripture, it begins with what I would call the call to serve begins with cooperation. There must be an attitude of cooperation. This is not a place for mavericks and for renegades and for do-it-yourselfers. The call to God to fulfill the mission that He has for His people must begin with an attitude of cooperation. The very first words that we read, 2 Corinthians 6.1 says, working together with Him. Working together is the same word there in the Greek from which we get our word synergy. And our goal in all service is not just simply to go do something, but to, excuse me, I think I need to cough. It is to find out what God is doing and for us to get on His agenda rather than trying to get God on our agenda. God wants us to enjoy the benefits and the blessings of walking with Him today and seeing His power released in and through our lives. But that never happens when we want to set the agenda for God instead of being willing to let God set the agenda for us. Someone as well said, many people want to serve God, but only in an advisory capacity. And I can tell you that's true. Some of the greatest joys of my life and some of the most enjoyable blessings of my life have come from working with people who rally together around God's mission. When I get around people who have an attitude of, Pastor, let's do this. Pastor, let's pray. Pastor, let's go. Pastor, let's make the ministry and the mission of reconciliation the priority. We're willing to change structures. 
We're willing to adapt schedules. We're willing to uh, refocus our strategies as long as what we do is always grounded in Scripture. We'll do whatever we need to do to change in order to reach. There's got to be an attitude where we are willing to work with God and to let God set the agenda and the tone of what we do. But I have to say that some of the greatest struggles and conflicts and heartaches that I have known in pastoral ministry have come when there is a conflict between the agenda of one set of people in the church and the agenda of another set of a people and even how that conflicts with God's agenda for the church. When people are asking questions like, hey, who's going to meet my needs? The church is here for me. And before we know it, there's this idea of self-indulgence and personal preference and traditions of insignificance and a desire for affirmation and approval and recognition. And when those self-serving, self-destructive attitudes become dominant in the church, the church becomes factional, the church becomes irrelevant to the culture around us, and that church will ultimately die. You want to know why churches die? Because they turn inward. They become all about ministering to us instead of the mission of going to reach others. And it's amazing how much God works in the heart of a church when a church is willing to let God reshape. In every generation, the mission that he wants to accomplish, always consistent with the scripture, but ever changing the context by which we do what we do in ministry. Paul says here, we work together with him and then he says, and we appeal to you, look again at verse 1, not to receive the grace of God in vain. The grace of God that you have received is not for your own indulgent purpose. It's not just so that you get fire insurance, miss hell, go to heaven. It's not just about you, but the grace of God that has come to you is to enable you and to empower you to live in light of that grace in such a way that because of gratitude for what God has done in your life, that you cannot help but seek to go and to reach others and to share that message of grace with them. How do I know that? Well, look at the next phrase. For he says, in a favorable time, I've listened to you. In a day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, now, there's an urgency. And Paul is saying we are urgent about the priority of the message and the ministry of reconciliation in this day and in this hour. And that urgency, church, has got to be captured in our hearts. We cannot let complacency, convenience, comfort, ever become the primary focus of what we do. I told you early on as your pastor that God has called me here to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And I hope I'm doing that job very well. There have to be both of these realities in our lives where we want to comfort and care and love but where at the same time we will not embrace the grace of God in vain and that we will let the grace that God has given to us create an urgency to reach others even as it creates a security that God will sustain us and God will enable us and God will guide us and God will help us and God will use us if we just have the attitude of cooperation. The second thing that I want us to see here today is not only that the call to serve begins with cooperation, which is an attitude, but the call to serve requires commitment. What does it require? The call to serve requires what? Say it. Commitment. And commitment is an action. Commitment is a willingness to do what needs to be done in a moment in time because it's what needs to be done. I'm going to get up. I'm going to get ready, I'm going to train, I'm going to engage, I'm going to act. Commitment is not passive. 
Commitment is responsible aggression to do what needs to be done. And the Bible tells us that Paul was committed. He was committed. It was a word of action. How do I know that? Well, again, look at verse 3. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. Literally, we are responsible leaders, but as servants of God, and that's how he saw himself, I am God's servant. We commend ourselves in every way by endurance And then he continues to give all of the life experiences and context that frankly were conflicts with his own comfort, but were challenges to live out his faith. Paul's faith was a faith that was lived. And that is the great challenge to you and to me is that our faith is not just a faith that is stated, but a faith that is lived. What is the greatest single criticism that we often hear about people in the church? What's the greatest single criticism that the world at large says about Christians? That we're hypocrites. We're hypocrites. That word hypocrite actually comes from the Greek language and the Greek culture in which during the time of the Greek theater, those who were the actors in the theater would wear a mask. And they were called the hypocrites. They were the ones who hid behind the mask to become whatever the mask was. And that's what hypocrisy is. It's when we wear a mask of presenting something to others that we are not inside. But when you look at Paul and you look at his life, he wasn't masking, parading his professional and powerful and influential and prosperous role as a pastor. Paul was a man who was a servant of God and who knew and understood the hardship, the rigors, the struggles of ministry, but he did not in any way let that keep him from fulfilling the commitment that he had made to the Lord. And there is a need for us to understand how important it is that we do away with our masks and we do away with every form of hypocrisy so that we can come before God and say, God, here I am, take my life and use me. K. Arthur, marvelous Bible teacher of this generation who's now very much up in years, still teaching, has impacted so many, but she said this, if you do not plan to live the Christian life totally committed to knowing your God, and to walking in obedience to Him, then don't begin. For this is what Christianity is all about. It is a change of citizenship, a change of governments, a change of allegiance. If you have no intention of letting Christ rule your life, then forget Christianity. It's not for you. And that's true. Because every one of us must see ourselves as servants of God, committed to the mission to which we have been called. So what does a servant look like? What are the characteristics of servant leaders that Paul highlights and outlines? Let me just quickly give you a list of several here. Number one, a servant leader welcomes accountability over autonomy. A servant leader welcomes accountability over autonomy. As I've already said, there are plenty of people who want to set their own agenda and to have their own autonomy, but the goal of being a servant of God is a sense of accountability within the context of the body of Christ, within the structure of leadership that God has provided in that body, so that we work together. I tell our staff all the time, it's not help unless it's help. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not help unless it's help. If you're not helping us to do what the mission is, then frankly, it's not help no matter how much help you give because your help is only helpful if it's helping to do what God has called us to do and if it's helping us to be in character what God desires us to be collectively as a people. And so we must work together to welcome accountability in our lives. Charles Swindoll once said, more than once, Jesus deliberately addressed certain issues that quickly diminished the number of onlookers. It was commitment that thinned the ranks. And that's true. Sometimes as a church, because of the level of commitment and accountability that is necessary, 
we have to be willing at times to be limited and even to struggle because we're not going to give on the issue of character and what that character is required in the heart of our people. Just a week ago, after a service, we had a gathering of our leadership, our life group leadership, other areas of leadership. And at that time, uh, we presented just as a means of clarifying expectations and, again, of maintaining standards of excellence and quality in what we do, something that we call the Servant Leadership Covenant. It's a printed document that we have available and that we are handing and asking and engaging with all of our Uh, all of our people who serve in ministry at every level of ministry to adapt and to understand. It says on the front page of this, a servant leader is a servant at heart, a leader in responsibility. And then it goes on to say, anyone can be a volunteer, but it takes a person who is uniquely gifted, called, and confirmed by God to be a true leader who serves. A servant leader takes ownership He or she does not commit to a task half-heartedly, but rather gives of himself or herself unconditionally and completely. Literally, to be a servant leader in this ministry is going to require commitment. But the first commitment is a commitment of character. And that's why the covenant says that as a servant leader, I will follow Christ, love others, uphold Scripture, align with Warren's mission, be committed, honor the policies of the church, communicate with leadership, attend worship services, pursue prayer and personal holiness, cultivate a teachable spirit, and affirm the biblical view of marriage, gender, and behavior as is expected both within the staff and with everyone who's a part of the leadership of our church. Why? Because servant leadership starts with accountability rather than autonomy. And Paul demonstrates that accountability here when he says, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that fault may not be found with our ministry, but as servants, we commend ourselves in every way. We're not hypocrites. Secondly, servant leaders choose perseverance over convenience. They choose perseverance over convenience. Don't have to look very far into this text to see that when Paul said, we in every way by great endurance, and then gives us the list of afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, I don't think we've asked that of any of our servants at the church. But you know what's amazing to me is how casually we're willing to volunteer and how carelessly we serve. When you make a commitment, when you agree to engage in service, make sure that it is a a service of perseverance and not one of convenience. Because convenience is not a way for any of us to live or to do ministry. Any chosen service, if it matters to the mission, is going to at times be inconvenient. And this is a list of amazing inconveniences But Paul didn't let the issue of comfort or convenience get in the way. He persevered. He was willing to stand up and stand under. J.H. Jowett said this, ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. The third thing that we see is that servant leaders demonstrate expressions of grace over expectations of justice. After that list of all those difficulties, the inconvenient realities in Paul's life, he begins in verse 6 talking about how that in his interactions with others, there's purity and knowledge and patience and kindness and genuine love and truthful speech. Paul says, we still live as ministers of grace, even though at times we are treated, or should I say mistreated, in injustice. And serving Christ and being a servant leader means that you do everything that you can to continue to live out the heart of a servant even when you're treated like a servant. Funny thing that I've noticed in me, and maybe you've seen it in you as well, is that it's a wonderful thing to have people talk about you and say, isn't he a wonderful servant? So humble, so genuine. Isn't he a servant? But boy, you let somebody treat me like a servant? Or I treat you like a servant? Or somebody else treats you like a servant? 
They don't ask permission. They don't give you affirmation and appreciation. They don't give you recognition. You know what happens? That old flesh bows up inside of us, doesn't it? And we're immediately like, well, why did they treat me like that? Don't they know what I'm, you know, I mean, just, it's amazing how easy it is to want justice in the way that people deal with us rather than to continue to be an extension of grace. I pray that this church, its campuses, its ministry would be such a place where the character of who we are because of the grace of God in our lives not being taken in vain would cause us to be the extension of grace in the lives of others over and over again. Paul pursued a mindset of godliness even in the face of pain and pressure and problems. David Jeremiah once said this, integrity is keeping a commitment even after circumstances have changed. That's what I'm talking about, is a willingness to demonstrate grace over an expectation of justice for ourselves. And that leads right into the fourth of, of these things, and that is that servant leaders pursue authenticity with God over the approval of others. A true servant leader is constantly more concerned about, am I living and being faithful to God than am I gaining the approval and the affirmations of people? William James, who was an early writer and founder in the role of psychology related to principles of psychology, did work in the area of human approval, and he said this, the deepest principle of human nature is a craving to be appreciated. Isn't that true? Doesn't everybody in this room want some level of appreciation of respect? But Paul didn't get respect. Paul didn't get appreciation. In fact, look at what he says in the latter part of this, after he talks about how they've guarded purity and patience and kindness and love, but then he says, through honor and dishonor, slander and praise, imposters yet true, known yet unknown, dying yet living, punished yet not killed, sorrowful yet rejoicing, poor yet rich, having nothing and having everything. It's just this paradox of, of living out his life and his faith and his mission, but he did it with a sense of concern that ultimately he would have the praise of God and not the praise of men. My wife, with whom I've now shared over four decades of life in ministry together, is such an incredible picture to me of someone who has always sought authenticity with God over the approval of others. I say that because every Sunday, she's not sitting on the front row. She's always serving on the front line. Every Sunday, she's in our preschool area taking care of as many crying babies as she can help to get her hands and her arms around on Sundays. She's there because she has committed her heart not to trying to be public in appearance, but to have the heart of a servant in meeting the needs of young parents and families and helping them to have security about the well-being of their children when they're placed in our care. And more than that, I have watched her as she plans and prays and prepares to be sure that it would always be about the mission, whether it's preschool or she serves in children's on Wednesday nights, whether it's in either of these capacities, her goal is to understand that our first mission field is our children. And if we don't reach them, we're not going to reach anybody else. And so she has over and over again stepped back from the platform in order to perform the greatest of service, to love and to care, where many times no one really knows even who she is. You don't see us together often on Sunday, and it's not because there's something wrong with our marriage. It's because there's something right in our mission, and we do it together. And her role in it is critical. Speaking of pastor's wives and being visible, I heard about a pastor's wife would always come and sit on the front row on Sunday morning. And she would always be right there where everybody knew where she was. And there was a little lady, an older lady, who kept watching one Sunday and noticed that two or three times during the course of the message that his wife would look at him while he was preaching and she would whew, kind of blow a little kiss. So after the service, this little lady came to the pastor and said, Pastor, 
said, I, I noticed that uh, your wife sits right down front every Sunday and just throws you little kisses of affection to encourage you while you're preaching. He said, ma'am, let me just clarify something. Those are not kisses of affection. K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid. She's trying to correct me. <laughs> well, I'm thankful that I have a wife whose role is not correction, though she can do that pretty well when needed, <laughs> but whose commitment is care and support for the ministry. Paul wanted the gratitude and the appreciation of the church at Corinth. But Paul would never, ever give up his willingness to be authentic with God in order to deal with even ingratitude and a lack of recognition to do the work at hand. Count Zinzendorf, who gave advice to the Moravian missionary movement in the early 1700s, once said this, the missionary must seek nothing for himself, no seat of honor, no report of fame. Like the cab horses in London, the count said, he must wear blinkers and be blind to every danger and every snare of conceit. He must be content to suffer, to die, and to be forgotten. That's a pretty straight up statement, isn't it? But let me just tell you this, you will never be forgotten. And the reason that I can tell you that is because Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10 says this, for God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love you have shown for his name in doing what? Serving the saints as you still do. God sees and knows. And just as much as the fear of the Lord is brought that God sees our sins that no one else sees, God sees service that no one else sees. And he will never forget. So we've looked at Two things, that the life of service, the call to serve begins with cooperation and attitude. The life of service requires commitment and action, but the call to serve, the call to serve needs servants. That's availability. We've got to be available. And my question to you today is, do you make yourself available to God? Listen to verse uh, 13 and following in this passage that we're looking at today, uh, or excuse me, verse 11 and following. Paul says, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You have not restricted by us, but you have restricted your own affections. In return, I speak to you. Literally, I appeal to you as children. Widen your hearts also. Won't you open your heart in return? Won't you serve? Won't you give? Won't you commit? That's what Paul was saying here at the end of this passage. It's time to open your heart. The call to serve needs servants. And today I want to close this message by highlighting one of the most significant servants in our ministry. It's a young man that I've been blessed to know now for many years. He often sends me emails telling me that he's praying for me. But several months ago, he sent me a series of emails where several times he said to me, Pastor, I want to help you preach. And I just believe that God was shaping something in his heart, a message that needed to be shared. And I want that young man's message to be the last part of this message as we co-preach to the conclusion of this time that we have together this morning. He has widened his heart, and I hope it will widen your heart also. Pay attention to the screen. Hey, Warren family, Grant Janik here, and I am so grateful to serve on team here at Warren as our family life pastor. And I'm especially grateful in this moment, right this second, to introduce to you a dear friend of mine named Ethan Ballard. Ethan has been an incredible young man that has grown up here at our church and has grown to become an incredible and faithful man of God in serving in so many ways. I recently had the privilege to sit with Ethan, his mother and his father. And as I know has been in his heart, he's had a desire to simply just tell the world about the God that he loves and the God that he serves. And mixed in with that is a little bit of his story, where he's come from, what he has been through, but I'm most excited for you to get to hear 
what Ethan is most passionate about, the man named Jesus Christ and how he's changed his life. Now, I do want you to know as you're getting to meet Ethan and know Ethan a little bit better, Ethan, in all of the incredible abilities that he has, is not able to talk with his own mouth. Instead, by the grace of God and the use of incredible technology, you'll get to hear Ethan's heart through the voice of the computer that will share his mind and his heart to you today. I hope and pray that you'll be blessed by hearing the story of Ethan. We were living as if he had cerebral palsy. That's what the doctors told us to do, even though when he was two and a half, his MRI looked like a leukodystrophy. Um, and then a few years ago, he's 19 now, but a few years ago, um, I think when he was 16, 16, we started seeing some things that didn't indicate cerebral palsy after all. We got a diagnosis um, two years ago, right after the world shut down from COVID. Um, we took him in February of 2020 and they called us the week after everything kind of shut down since we couldn't come back in and told us that he had um, Icardi Gutierrez, which is a leukodystrophy. And so it's a degenerative, a degenerative process that's happening with him. But despite all that and all the hospitalizations, we went through 40 days in the hospital in 2020, which, um, you know, all I can think of is 40 days, um, as the significance of that. We went through emergency surgeries and ICUs and everything during that stay, but he was still smiling. We didn't think we were gonna walk out with him, but he was still smiling and still telling people about God and the doctors that would come in. He asked if he could pray for them. So he's, uh, he's not letting anything stop him. My name is Ethan Ballard. I am 19 years old and I go to Greenbrier High School. I want to work with the church because I love God. I want people to know God loves us. I want people who do not know God to know him and save their life. I do not like when people do bad things because that makes God not happy. God is very important to us every day. He helps us when we ask. God helps me not worry about my health. I get sick but God helps me. I had emergency surgery a few times but he gave me the best doctor. Dr. Walters fixed me. God gives me a good team. I love being baptized so people can see that I trust God. I love to tell people about God. I love God music. I am happy I have people to help me. I like going to NASCAR races and watching football games. Go dogs. I'm so glad you're getting to meet my friend named Ethan. And what I love about his story is that he's not just a man that comes and participates in church or things like that. But if you ever look at any of his posts or his parents' posts, Ethan wants the world to know about the God that he loves and that he serves. Back in 2013, our church had the joy of walking with Ethan through the experience of believer's baptism. And from that point, even to where we are here and now in life, Ethan has been a faithful warrior for the cause of Christ and the spreading of the gospel and the greatest message on earth, the news that God has sent his son named Jesus. And what I love particularly about Ethan is that he doesn't just accept this message. He doesn't just sit still in his faith, but he is an active participant serving the local church and glorifying his God through his service and his willingness to serve. Listen to these few things that Ethan is involved in the life of our church. He's one of our online moderators for our online campus at church. It's so exciting to always see Ethan chiming in and on the live stream and what is being discussed. He also is a faithful prayer warrior. I know even some of our own staffers have been blessed by Ethan's emails and texts of encouragement and prayer. And I know that Ethan would love to be a prayer warrior for you if you'd be able to get in touch and to connect with him. I know also Ethan is very involved with our Together at Warren ministry, our ministry for God's uniquely gifted individuals. And not only that, but Ethan is one of the bright and shining faces that so faithfully, so regularly greets, welcomes and greets members as they come onto our campus on a Sunday morning. Listen a little bit more to what Ethan says about how service is part of his faith and his trust in his God. First thing is he does want to share his testimony to everyone. Um, he's just so excited to, anytime he talks to him, whether for, well, he always says, how can I pray for you? So 
So he's always communicating that. Always getting us up early just so he's online, so he can get online and, and make sure he's a part of the service and ask people if they need prayer because he's there to, to pray with them that morning. So. My church is very nice and good for us. I love working on the computer at home so people can pray. If you need prayer, please let me know. You can send me a message or email. I share the Bible and God music on Facebook. I love coming to church and being with my together leaders and friends. Mr. Goolsby and wife help me. Mrs. KD help me too. I love welcoming people to Warren so they know I am happy they are here. Welcome to Warren. I want all people to know God loves us and he will help us. I am in a wheelchair but it is okay. God helps me with my health. I know he wants me to tell people about him. Where there's a will, there's a way. Ethan doesn't let his nonverbal skills stop him. He uses his computer. He doesn't let his wheelchair stop him. He has a buddy that will push him or drive him. He has been adamant that he wants to preach. He wants to tell people about God. So um, we are finding a way to make that happen. He wants, wants everybody to know God. <laughs> God wants us to tell others about him. We need to help people know God. I am in a wheelchair, but it is okay. I am praying for people that need to know about God. He is very important to us every day. Please note that God loves us so much. We are very thankful God saves our lives. We need prayer for people who do not know about God. He is so good all the time. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. If Ethan Ballard can answer our call to preach and can be willing to let the limitations that he has faced become open doors to be a greeter at the campus here in Augusta every Sunday. Surely this opens your heart to think that maybe God could use you too. I had the privilege of seeing Ethan between services today. He was doing his job greeting and then was leaving with his family. But this young man is just an amazing young man who is fully committed to living for Christ despite the challenges, obstacles, and limitations that he's faced. And so I'm just saying to you today, don't let you limit you. Open your heart, expand your affections, widen your heart, and realize that God has a purpose and a plan for you to worship, to connect, and to serve. So Father, today I pray for that renewed sense of commitment in us, a commitment that calls us beyond convenience, a commitment that calls us to sacrifice, a commitment that makes us willing to be accountable and responsible, and Lord, to engage together in the work and the mission of the gospel. Father, I thank you for your church called Warren and for your work in this place today. But I pray, Father, that the effect of this morning will be far beyond this moment and this experience. But God, that for many days to come, there will be people who will widen their hearts and open their hands and serve for the glory of Christ in whose name I pray, amen.